Um, our next presenters are from the Good Shepherd organisation, and I know today that um, uh, Good Shepherd has its wider team here, so thank you so much for coming. Um, we have two presenters. Um, from Good Shepherd. We have Dr. Jessica Kooten, who is the Acting Head of Research and Evaluation. And we have Tristan Saltness, who's the National Program Manager um, for the Financial Independence um, Hub, which um, Good Shepherd runs. Um, today, they're going to talk about um, rebuilding women's financial security, a topic that's been talked about already and one that I think is going to be a bit of um, increasing importance in the years to come. So could I ask you to come up on stage, please? Thank you. No one can see me now. Um, so that's next. And the award goes to. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I'm Jossica and I've got with me um, uh, Tristan. So Mike and colleagues, thanks for inviting us here today. Um, we're just going to briefly describe how Good Shepherd uses a strengths-based approach in one of its program areas. But I'm first going to start off with a little bit of, just a little bit of history to just put the whole program in context um, about Good Shepherd. So um, most people from Melbourne will recognise this as the Abbotsford Convent down in um, Abbotsford. And this was the site where four Good Shepherd sisters in 1863 established the convent and residential care for children, women and young people who were either unable to live with their families, um, didn't have housing or weren't attending school. Um, so they first came out to Australia because their aim was to assist women who were having, uh, struggling to cope with the conditions and you possibly could imagine what they were like during the gold rush um, era here in Melbourne in the 1860s, so it was quite dire. Um, so the approach that Good Shepherd obviously had in that time, like many institutions, was that of uh, charitable focus and paternalistic, and we heard that word being used earlier. But we've since shifted from that to a more of a needs-based approach, and it most recent, in the most recent decades, to a strengths-based approach. However, our Good Shepherd values have always been actually client-centred, and one of our primary um, values is um, seeing the value of each person and respecting everyone's rights. And that, that, that was one of the fundamental values from even back then. Uh, the other values, such as reconciliation, justice, audacity and zeal, basically gives Good Shepherd the kind of um, imprimatur to go out, solve problems and deal with the issues um, that are there for people who are experiencing the most amount of vulnerability. And also to note that <coughs> this year marks actually 160 years of Good Shepherd um, organisation in Australia. Our values haven't changed, but our insights about our history um, and how we've progressed from there have very well much changed. That's good. So, our programs and services, this is our vision now, um, are there to support women, girls and their families to be strong, safe, well and connected. And I've been at Good Shepherd for, I think, five months, feels like five years, but, um, and I understand that this actual mission came from, or this vision came from a participant in our family violence programs, as, as this was developed as this is what the goal is for our programs. So we cover a whole range of, pro of programs at Good Shepherd. So from um, very much focused on family and domestic violence, counselling and support. Uh, we have a lot of children's and young parents programs such as uh, supported playgroups and supported parenting programs. We also have refuges for women um, escaping um, family violence. We have uh, financial counselling and coaching. It's probably one of our biggest programs. We've always worked in the area of improving women's financial um, security. We also have a program of providing no interest loans. You might have heard of NILS and the, the good money stores. That's in partnership uh, with the NAB. And we also have a financial abuse recovery program. So I'm actually gonna focus on this last aspect and it's the program that Tristan is going to talk about because this is a little bit about what was noted before as we're very good at problem identification. 
So what is um, financial abuse? So financial abuse is a form of domestic and family violence, but it can actually operate independently of um, financial abuse or what we commonly understand as financial abuse. So it's just it's a way of controlling people through their money and resources that makes them completely dependent on other people. You may know of people in your family, in your friendship groups, you may have had um, experiences yourself. So it's one of uh, those main reasons why women don't leave abusive relationships or have to go back to those abusive relationships because they don't have um, sufficient finances or accommodation. It basically traps people there. And in this quote from 2008 from an academic in the US, it's about behaviours that control a person's ability to acquire, use and maintain their economic resources. So it's not just about income, it's also about your access to other things that enable you to um, to um, have economic security and your potential for self-sufficiency. So the thing that we know at Good Shepherd is that um, clients often don't recognise that they're experiencing economic abuse and we've actually been working in this area for quite some time. So um, I think it was early 2000s, 2010s, we started a big research program investigating people's experience of economic abuse. But one piece in the puzzle that was there was actually quantifying what, what was the prevalence of economic abuse in the community and what were the relevant risk factors. And I think one of the things that we've learned from today is practitioners have a lot of insights. Pr practitioners are at the coal face. Um, so they learn from clients, but also industry and other bodies can learn from what practitioners are seeing in the, um, in the field. Now we can go to my graph. Um, so then I embarked on a research program myself looking into the prevalence of economic abuse and then went into looking at the nature and extent of economic abuse for young adults because I was interested in that prevention component. Not, the, not about the crisis, not about the recovery uh, component, but looking at how can we prevent it. I can do another presentation on that in another, on another day. Um, but what we found from this data, and this was from the 2012 um, uh, Australian Bureau of Statistics Personal Safety Survey. So this is where the federal government gets all their domestic violence statistics. Either I've got superpowers or um, <laughs> I'll just leave that there so I don't touch it. Right, too much electromagnetic things happening here. Um, and so what we can see um, using that data set that 16% of women and 7% of men have ever experienced some form of economic abuse with a current or past partner that they had previously lived with. Um, the most recent data that was collected during the pandemic actually comes up with the same um, kind of statistics, but that's, uh, we're thinking of somewhat um, an underestimate given that they actually asked a whole, uh, a whole raft of, uh, like they doubled the number of items that they used to measure that. So we spotted this problem. We know that there are a lot of services working in the crisis um, space in terms of domestic violence, but Good Shepherd detected another need and that was looking at the recovery space. So I will now hand over to Tristan. Thank you. So I've been working for Good Shepherd now for just on three years. And before I started in this role as the National Program Manager for the Financial Independence Hub, I was working at the coalface as an advanced family violence practice leader at the Orange Door, which most of you would probably know uh, is the intake and crisis point for people experiencing family violence, um, supports for families, and also for support for men who use violence. So it's not been that long ago since I've been at the coalface and I've been part of practice. So I think it really lends itself well to this particular position because with the Financial Independence Hub, it can be quite difficult for workers sometimes when they're at the coalface or they're dealing with um, you know, recovery from family and domestic violence. It's sometimes tricky, funnily enough, to talk about money. It's okay to talk about physical and sexual violence, but financial situations, income, people would come to me and say, can I have some brokerage for a month's rent? And I'd say, what's their income and can they actually afford it for the following month? I don't know, all I've asked about is the abuse. So I'm feeling really passionate about this to really try and empower people to be able to move forward um, through a life, not only without family violence, but also financial independence. 
We're actually funded by the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, which is quite unique. Um, one minute left. Wow, that was quick. Okay, I'll talk fast. Um, but you don't have to be a Commonwealth Bank customer to um, be supported in our service. We are and always have been strengths-based and trauma-informed. We walk alongside the participant and we uh, go at their pace as to what they're wanting. So we want them to leave the program feeling capable, confident, independent and in control. We support victim survivors, or in a more strength-based language, people who are experiencing family violence and domestic violence, um, to move on to a life to be able to manage their own finances. And a lot of people don't actually realise, as Jossica mentioned, that they are experiencing financial abuse. And so we can educate them that, on those factors as well and the fact that it is actually family violence and validate what they're feeling. But quite often people don't want to be pigeonholed. That's why we're talking about strengths-based today as well. So we don't like to use the terms financial abuse often. It's more about how can we help you to be financially independent when we understand that you've had an experience of family and domestic violence. We're a national program, which is also quite unique. Uh, another unique factor is that the family violence doesn't have to be current. A lot of programs out there are funded for current family violence. You can come in and out of the program as many times as you like. We also know that family violence isn't linear. So you might be at a stage where, and look, honestly, seven to nine times it takes for someone to come to a support service to say, hey, you know what, I actually feel like I'm ready to do something. They might go in and out of that relationship or those support agencies over a period of time. So we're okay with that. We can put that on hold and they can come back when they're ready and we can support them. It's a personalised journey, as I mentioned, because every single person is completely individual. Uh, we also have access to, we've got our own FIH loans, plus we also can refer on to NILS loans. We make referrals to other support services. We can talk about people just even opening up an email with a bill in it, because sometimes that can just be absolutely terrifying. We have our own financial counsellors, we have financial coaches, another fabulous support where if you are actually ready at the next stage of your journey to really look at some long-term financial goals, we've got lots of tools that we can use to help support people. And we're all, um, we support all genders, and just so long as you're living in Australia, you can be on a visa, you don't have to be a permanent resident, which is another unique um, um, feature. Do we have, we don't have time, finish please. Okay. Don't get more subtle than that. We did have a video to show you, which um, maybe we can send around, Mike, at some stage, if that's okay. Um, but I'll be around later for any questions. Thank you.